Welcome back, everyone. We are at Acts chapter 2. We read till verse 30. We saw how the work of the Spirit received two responses. One, a positive uh, response where people were uh, inquisitive about what God was doing uh, through the Galileans. The other one was a negative response where uh, the believers were accused of being drunk uh, and uh, they were labeled as being full of new wine. Now, let's move ahead. I said that we will read the next uh, portion here and try to understand what is going on. Um, so could somebody please help me to read from verse 14 to 21? Ma'am, till which was? Okay. So, uh, thank you, Rosalind. Uh, from verse 14 to 21. Okay. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Rosalind. Let's look at this passage that Rosalind has uh, read for us from verse 14 to 21, where Peter stands up with the 11. Who are the 11? All the existing uh, apostles or disciples, and uh, Matthias has also joined the team. So Peter, his, assuming his natural his his uh, natural uh, personality because he seems to be a leader who's jumping in to resolve problems to provide an explanation to um, steer people in a certain direction so naturally nobody's asking him to do these things but god has given him that grace uh, uh, and uh, maybe even personality wise he he has that capability so he's stepping up and uh, when he notices that people are calling them full of new wine, or in other words, drunk, uh, he tries to explain to the people. What is he saying? He says, he raised his voice and said to them. So you'll notice that this is a sermon because he starts to explain the phenomenon and then he will go on to uh, talk about the fulfillment of what God has promised to the Jews. Uh, and so he says, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And heed my words. So he, he uh, makes a statement saying, these are not drunk the way 
you suppose. Okay? And he also uh, uh, reminds them that it is the third hour of the day. So third hour of the day would be 9 a.m. So uh, we could assume uh, that people get drunk uh, later in the evening and uh, you know through the night. But how can you expect somebody to be so drunk at 9 a.m.? So he's just kind of uh, helping them think logically over here. He says, no, they are not drunk. It's just 9 in the morning. So what is going on? And he refers to the prophet Joel, who the Jews uh, know about. And he begins to say, hey, don't you remember? So in Joel chapter 2 uh, is the prophecy of the, uh, you know, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So he kind of repeats. He repeats that same uh, prophecy here. And he says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So this is what Joel had prophesied. And he's repeating that prophecy. He said, in the last days, which are the last days? The last days, uh, as far as the Bible is concerned, are the days after the ascension of the Lord Jesus, up until the return of Christ, or meaning the, uh, uh, you know, the second coming of Christ. So these are the last days. So it's not so much that, you know, uh, 2000s, these are the last days. What, when the Bible talks about the last days, it's from the time that Jesus has ascended up into heaven and he's going to return. So these are the last days. So in these last days, what can we expect? What will God do? I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now in the Old Testament, things were slightly different. We see that the power of the Holy Spirit was uh, made manifest in the lives of priests or prophets or kings. So the anointing would come upon each of uh, these, each of these categories, and they would be the ones who would hear from God and speak to the people or um, uh, walk in miracles, uh, signs, wonders, so on and so forth. But there is a shift coming in the last days. What is that shift? He reminds them, don't you know that the prophet Joel said, I will pour out my spirit on who? One or two people? All flesh. All flesh. So uh, divided tongues of fire sat on each of them. Why? Because of this promise. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And God is not exempting anyone. God is not discriminating uh, on the basis of age or on the basis of gender because the prophet Joel said, your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So what is he trying to say? He's saying that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on everyone without making you know a distinction on the basis of who they uh, you know what their age is or what their gender is and another thing is when the spirit is poured out there will be a manifestation right of the work of the spirit or you could also look at uh, some of the things that are being spoken of here as uh, uh, you know the way the Holy Spirit communicates. So the Holy Spirit is going to work in everyone's life. And he lists out a couple of uh, things which come under the category of the prophetic. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So the prophetic will manifest upon the people. Okay, let's move on. He says, men servants, maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So meaning from the time Jesus was ascended, uh, lifted up, he ascended, till now, the promise remains. So people will receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. What will accompany? Verse 19, I will show wonders. 
uh, oh, uh, and they shall prophesy. I shall, I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. So this is the uh, the you know powerful work of God in the form of miracles, signs, wonders, manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. All this will accompany the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then again, you know, he uh, talks about the culmination of uh, the last days. So meaning the last of the last days when the Lord Jesus will return. And uh, some statements that say the sun uh, shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So uh, we are also told that these are the days when uh, people can receive salvation by accepting the work that the Lord Jesus has done on the cross. So, you know, some uh, uh, some uh, people, some uh, men of God, women of God, they term it as the period of grace or, uh, you know, the time of salvation where uh, the Holy Spirit is being poured out and people are being brought into the kingdom of God. They are being saved. They are receiving salvation. So all these things uh, were promised in God's word for us. Okay. Now, we will continue because... Uh, I want us to, okay, just one second. Yeah, give me one moment. So I want to elaborate on one particular words. Or anything, we'll come to that uh, scripture. Fine. Uh, so he has explained about the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit uh, through, through those who are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, let's read on. Let's read on from verse 22 to 28. Could somebody help me read this, please? You can do, just do a quick read. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my eye, before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Amen. Yes, thank you, Rose. So Peter is uh, continuing with his explanation. Uh, he is well-versed with the promises of um, you know, the uh, old covenant and uh, the scriptures. So he's quoting quite a bit of uh, the scriptures for the Jews because who's his audience? He's being very, context, uh, you know, contextual. Uh, he's speaking to the Jews. He's speaking to uh, the devout men who have come to worship God. And so he spoke about Prophet Joel. And now he is going to speak about David. But he's making a beautiful connection uh, of David and Jesus. Now, this is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times. Uh, we would all recall that he was definitely not the kind of disciple that Jesus would have wanted him to be in uh, the most trying times. When he uh, actually needed to stand up for Christ. 
that was the time when he chose to escape the scene because he was so covered in. But right now, what's happening? Peter has uh, demonstrated great courage. Now, we may point to Acts chapter 1 and say, Peter seems quite courageous. Even in Acts chapter 1, that's true. So, there are a couple of things that have brought a great change uh, in this man called Peter. One is the resurrection of Christ. So, after he witnessed the resurrection of Christ, what happens? He's changed. He's become bold. Now, what is the second thing that has taken place in his life? Just now, moments before, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's so bold because, notice, it's only 50 days since Jesus was tried in the same region. Everyone knows, you know, if it was the time uh, that we live in, it would still be in the news. It would still be in social media about, you know, Pontius Pilate and Jesus and Judas and those, oh, those 12 guys, you know. So he, his name was probably well known among the people around that, hey, this man, he is one of them. Now that Jesus, uh, uh, you know, resurrected, there would have been rumors about what these disciples have done to the body of Jesus. So, so many things were going on in Jerusalem and Judea. At this time, for Peter to stand up and boldly talk about Jesus was something really marvelous. And he's directly talking to the Jews of all the regions. He says, men of Israel, these words, Jesus of Nazareth. What does he say about Jesus of Nazareth? A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. And if, you know, that was not enough, he goes ahead, you know, he narrates the whole thing about how Jesus came and he died, uh, he was crucified. And, uh, but the way he speaks is, uh, he was taken by lawless hands. So it's a little bit of accusation, you know, uh, which he is pointing out um, and he is making this point that the people were the ones who did it even though Jesus of Nazareth attested by God meaning God affirmed him God backed him up but the people lawless hands have crucified so he is not afraid to speak the truth and he's standing up in front of everyone and speaking like this but he says, you know what? But God raised him up. Why? He goes back to a promise uh, in, in uh, you know, the Psalms where uh, uh, it is spoken of David that God will, will not let right? uh, his soul rest in Hades. Hades is uh, the, the place that contained hell. Now, when Peter is saying that God promised David that he would not, uh, his soul would not remain in hell, uh, he will slowly make the connection and uh, remind the people that, look, though this promise was given to David, where is our father David? He's in the grave. So he'll go, go out to say that. He'll say, look, he's still in the grave. So just think with me, who is this person? that God was speaking about, that he will not let that person remain in Hades, or uh, he will not let that person remain in death. In other words, that's what it means, uh, not so much hell. So when we think about this, we realize it is the Lord Jesus, because he was the one who was resurrected. So what is Peter saying? Peter is pointing towards Jesus. Peter is pointing towards uh, the fact that he was the Messiah. And Peter is pointing towards the fact that he is the resurrected Messiah, okay? uh, who the scriptures are talking about. So that's that's the point that he's making. Uh, let's go ahead. We will read. We will read from verse 29 and uh, go till verse 37. One more person. Could you please go ahead and read for us?
should I mind? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the, let all the house of Israel know Assuredly, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I can continue. Uh, no, we can stop here, Rosalind. Thank you. Okay. So let's go back to what uh, Rosalind uh, read here. I was telling us that Peter is quoting uh, from the Psalms. He is referring to David. And notice he uses the term patriarch. Patriarch is the men who were father figures to the, uh, you know, the Jewish uh, people. In Judaism, they are like the main personalities that people revered and they followed, like Abraham, uh, Jacob, so David. Now he says the patriarch David. Uh, he reminds the people that David is dead. But what did David write? He said, uh, he wrote and uh, uh, said in the Psalms that, you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. But if David wrote this about himself, he should be alive today because his body should not have been, uh, uh, you know, it, it must not become dust. But he says, David is both dead and buried. And as a proof or evidence, we all know that his tomb is with us to this day. So obviously, when David talked about being alive, he did not talk about himself. He was talking about somebody else. So he's making that connection back to Jesus. He already said, Jesus of Nazareth, attested by signs and miracles, you know, by God, whom you crucified. Okay. And he continues about Jesus. He says, it was Jesus that David said, well, he's the Christ who will sit on the throne. That's the promise God made to David and said, you'll always have somebody. Uh, sitting on the throne. Who is this somebody? It's Jesus. So he's telling the Jews. Scriptures are quite clear. And I want to tell you that this is who Jesus is. So he's preaching. Okay. So he's preaching to the people. Preaching about whom? Preaching about Jesus as the Messiah. Very bold of Peter to do this. And this happened moments after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, he's also talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I told us it's very dangerous for Peter to do this at this time. But uh, he is speaking the truth very boldly in verse 31. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ. Now he's no longer saying Jesus. He's even saying Christ. Meaning it's a given that, you know, Jesus is the Messiah. Christ is the Messiah. That his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. 32. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So remember Acts 1 8. What does it say? Um, you know, I, I will pour out my uh, spirit. 
and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. So what is Peter doing now after being baptized in the Holy Spirit? He is a witness for Jesus. He has witnessed the life of Jesus, and now he's standing as a witness for all that Jesus went through, even his resurrection. He's saying, look, we are witnesses. Christ has raised, uh, God has raised him from the dead. And he also adds, being exalted to the right hand of God. Meaning, now he's up in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. So they know where Christ is as, uh, you know, as the disciples. And he says, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. So he is reminding the people. What you just saw happen is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit by this Jesus who is with the Father now. Remember, even John the Baptist had mentioned it. He said, I baptize you in water, but he who is coming after me shall baptize you in spirit, uh, sorry, in uh, uh, Holy Spirit and in fire. Who is this person who is going to baptize the Holy Spirit and fire? The Lord Jesus. So that is the promise of the Holy Spirit which was mentioned you know, uh, with regard to what Jesus is going to do. And now Peter is saying that's exactly what has happened. He's gone. Uh, and uh, in uh, the book of John, we know that Jesus uh, shared about the Holy Spirit and said that when I go, he will come. Right, the comforter, he will come and he will lead you into all truth. Uh, he, he will do all these wonderful works. So, Jesus ascended up into heaven, but now he has fulfilled the promise of sending the Holy Spirit and even baptizing people in the Holy Spirit. Now, how does it help to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? There are many things that we can talk about, uh, but when we go back to what John the Baptist said, that you know he will baptize you in uh, the Holy Spirit and in fire. Remember uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers in uh, Acts 2, there were divided tongues of fire. So what does this fire signify? Signify the presence of God. But also one of the works of fire is to clean. Fire will burn up the lighter things and you know the more precious things will remain in fire so that way fire is used to purify metals fire is used to uh, you know uh, burn up the chaff in the same way when one is baptized in the holy spirit we know acts 1 8 we will be empowered to be witnesses for christ but what is the other function of the fire of the baptism of the holy spirit it will clean up the life of a believer the fire of the holy spirit cleanses us sanctifies us okay so that is what was going on right now when the uh, outpouring of the holy spirit happened upon these 120 people also see this lovely uh, sentence of peter he says he poured out this which you now see and hear okay let's think about that so what is Peter doing? Giving an explanation to what has just happened. So God has poured out his spirit uh, because Jesus is the one who has done this. He's gone to the Father. He sent his spirit. You now see and hear. So the Jews have witnessed that. You know, the mighty uh, sound and the people speaking in tongues. And Peter is also quoted Joel. But notice, in the prophecy of Joel, what did, what did uh, Joel say? He said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So there are at least three things that Joel mentioned. Prophecy, dreams, visions. Now think with me. Peter is saying, in verse 33, which you now see and hear. Did they hear prophecy? 
Did the people hear prophecy? I'm just asking you. Any idea? Was Not was there sure. any? Yeah, Roslyn. Not sure. Not sure. Okay. Uh, were there any dreams, any visions that Luke uh, wrote about? No, isn't it? In Acts 2, we only heard tongues. They spoke in tongues. And that's what the people observed. There's no prophecy. There's no dreams. There's no visions. But what is Peter saying? Peter is saying, in verse 33, which you now see and hear. But that's not what they saw. They didn't see prophecy. They didn't see... Uh, you know, dreams and visions, the witnesses or, or the uh, truth. Then how is it that Peter is connecting tongues to prophecy, dreams and visions? It's the Holy Spirit who gave him the understanding that though Joel is talking about a different manifestation, first time, even Peter, in his whole life, it is the first time he is experiencing speaking in tongues, but he's connecting it to the, to the promise of the Father, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. How? By the revelation that the Spirit of God gave him. So we have to understand, when the Holy Spirit manifests himself, it could be with any set of gifts, but it is the same Holy Spirit. So the outpouring, Peter correctly interpreted, though the, it, the uh, first day there was nothing to do about prophecy. It was to do with a new kind of manifestation for all of them, which is tongues. But Peter recognized and he said, which you now see and hear. Okay, He connected it. This is it. This is what Joel was talking about. Though there is no prophecy, no dreams, no visions. There are tongues, but this is that. Right? So it's beautiful how God gave him the capacity to interpret what was going on. And that he was able to rightly point it out and tell the people uh, unmistakably, this is the fulfillment of that promise, which we have all been waiting for for many years. Joel prophesied it's going to happen, and it's happening right now. Okay, So let's read on from verse 34 now. Verse 34 to, um, oh yeah, uh, I think uh, Rosen already read. So again, you know, there is this explanation about uh, uh, David and the fact that it was not David who ascended, but it was actually Jesus who ascended. Now, once the uh, message about the Messiah was preached to all these Jews who were waiting for an explanation, what is going on? Right? So Peter gives this explanation. And in verse 37, scriptures tell us, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. To cut to the heart is uh, an expression to state that they were impacted, they were touched, they were moved. Uh, and, you know, they um, needed to now respond. It, it, the message went to them in such a powerful way. So this also shows us that whenever we, we preach, right, uh, the Holy Spirit will work in the hearts of the people. And when we are preaching aligned to the word of God, when we are preaching aligned to the leading of the spirit of God, what happens? It really ministers to people's hearts. And in this case, those who are listening, they were cut to the heart or they were convicted. In other words, they were convicted. and. <clears throat> Think about this. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So when they were convicted, they realized that, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. This is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And uh, we missed the boat. You know, in a sense, uh, Jesus is already, he has ascended. Now what do we do? What are we supposed to do? to receive of the promise of the Father. 
and to uh, acknowledge who the Lord Jesus is. So it's a beautiful situation for an evangelist because, you know, uh, for an evangelist, they want to see a response from the people or even, you know, for each of us as believers, when we're sharing about Christ, uh, we sometimes we watch oh is that person going to cry or is that person going to what reaction can i get from this person is the message really touching their hearts now if they cry or their expression changes they look you know uh, then somewhere we are happy ah, okay whatever we have spoken is making a difference to this person but think about this you know if we have preached to uh, someone or the people and it seemingly is not making any difference Neither in that uh, moment or in the days or weeks to come, there is no difference in the people. That's quite uh, tough, isn't it? But when we preach the word of God, empowered by the spirit of God, what was the impact? And Peter, it was a tough day for him because he didn't know in God's calendar, God is going to pour out the Holy Spirit. Maybe Peter had his own diary, right? Like we all have our diaries, we write out, okay, today this is what I'm going to do. But what did the scripture say? Suddenly, there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. And the Holy Spirit was poured out. People are asking the question, what is going on? Peter stands up. He's not even written down his sermon. Imagine, if he was not ready for this. He doesn't have a ready-made sermon. He doesn't have chat GPT. <laughs> right? I'm just simply joking here. But uh, he he doesn't know what to do. How do I get a sermon now? People have gathered from all over the region. And I have to preach to them. But led by the Spirit. right? Based on the scriptures, he quite beautifully, being a Galilean, people are listening to him quite eloquently. Uh, clearly, he's able to explain Jesus is the Messiah. What you're seeing now is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, he preached in such a way that it convicted the listeners. And uh, they asked they asked the question, you know, what, what a, a successful sermon. Because he doesn't have to go asking them, okay, what is your decision? What is your decision? I just preached a message. They are responding to Jesus and they are saying, what shall we do? Just tell us. You tell us what we have to do and we'll do it. So it was an amazing day, the, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. What happens? 38, Peter talks to them. He tells them that Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he shows them the path, the path of salvation. You uh, acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, um, uh, you know, commit your life to the Lord. Then you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Whatever we have received, you will also receive. Then verse 39, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So that day, 2,000 years ago, Peter talked about you and me. Okay, Today we are sitting and we are studying the book of Acts. But on that day, his first sermon, he mentioned you. He mentioned me. Where? Here in verse 39, he says, the promise is to you, meaning the Jews, to your children. So you may say the descendants of, of the uh, Jews, but he included others and to all who are afar off, meaning you and me and our generations, you know, people from every nation, tribe and tongue, as many as the Lord our God will call. So there is a promise right there about the Holy Spirit for every believer. What did Peter say? Is this outpouring of the Holy Spirit only for 120 people? Is it only for those who listen to the sermon on that day? No. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all who are afar off. Meaning today, whoever is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a promise that we can hold on to. And that promise says that you know the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon each of us individually. 
divided tongues of fire sat on each believer. And Peter also said that as many as the Lord our God will call, meaning those who are who are being saved right across the nations, they are all uh, invited to receive of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So God does not discriminate as far as like salvation is concerned. You know, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And even as far as the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit is concerned, God is not discriminating. He's saying, Whomever the Lord our God shall call, His promise remains. Those who are afar off, His promise remains. So uh, it's an encouragement for all of us today. For us, even when we pray for anyone, Maybe people may come to us and say, uh, please pray, I want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Jesus. I'm born again. I'm saved. Confidently we can pray. Okay, Acts 2.39. Yes, this promise is for you. You believe in Jesus. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is for every believer. You can boldly pray for them. Okay, So this is how on the very first day when the Holy Spirit was poured out, uh, Peter's uh, sermon was successful. Okay, now let's see what else happened. Could uh, somebody help me read uh, from verse 40 to 47? Verse 40 to 47. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be safe from this per per perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued st steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles now all who believe were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Amen. Thank you, uh, Zeli, for uh, reading that. So we see how the church was born. Who is the church? The church. It's all the believers uh, in the Lord Jesus. So 120 people on that day they were gathered, um, but even beyond that, after the baptism in the Holy Spirit, on the first day, how many people were, were saved? How many people were added to the church? Anyone? How many souls were added? 3,000. 3,000, teacher. 3,000. So, ah, wow. What if this happened today? You know, we go for uh, uh, an evangelistic crusade. 3,000 people are saved. And, uh, you know, they are baptized. It's amazing how the church grew. In one day, 3,000 people have joined the church. So there was no particular, uh, you know, fellowship like this in Jerusalem. But the birth of the church, a lot of um, uh, historians, uh, you know, Bible scholars, they, they call this passage, uh, Acts 2, as the birth of the church because on one day these people came together and sort of the activities of the church have started here what's happening in verse 4 verse 40 itself um, you know peter after he preached about um, the lord jesus and salvation he's preaching about sanctification he's saying be saved from this perverse generation so uh, yes receive be born again but also live a holy life before God, live a righteous life before God, uh, live by the power of the Spirit. Uh, what else is he saying? He's saying, uh, um, oh, verse 42, uh, 
they are being taught how to live how to live so now people are born again that's the beginning of the journey that's not the end of the journey that's the beginning of the journey so in verse 42 they are being trained as disciples the way jesus trained them they now have to train the others because in uh, matthew 28 what did jesus say go into all the world make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the uh, you know holy spirit and teaching them isn't it he said teaching them all that i have taught you and you know lord uh, behold i am with you uh, even to the end of the age so one of the things that jesus told us to do uh, is not just to win souls but to make disciples of all nations see how the early church is functioning 3000 people are added now they're all born again you have to disciple them how to disciple them Okay, verse 42, Stead, continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So that means regularly teaching them what is apostles' doctrine. Apostles' doctrine is, um, you know, they believed in the scriptures, uh, like the Torah, which the, the Jews believed in, because that is something that Jesus also would read and, you know, would uh, meditate on. So they believed in uh, those early uh, five uh, books but in addition to that they had the teachings of jesus about the kingdom of god remember even after he's resurrected he took time to teach them about the kingdom of god so it's a combination of these things the early scriptures as well as the teachings of jesus is what is known as the apostles doctrine so they were passing on what was passed on to them and that is how we make disciples so whatever we know, whatever has built us in our spiritual walk, we are supposed to faithfully pass it on to the people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what it means. So one thing to do uh, when you know we are raising up a church or we're discipling people is you pass on, help people to learn the doctrine and fellowship. Notice how fellowship is another aspect. So. Uh, Till now, we don't, you know, uh, really see a manner in which the growth of believers is being guided you know, by, by the disciples. But after the outpouring in the Holy Spirit, teaching them the word, fellowshipping, that's why, uh, you know, coming together as a church family for Sunday service or uh, having other opportunities like... Uh, your life groups, connecting with people, growing together. It's very scriptural. We cannot say that uh, we, we don't want it at all because it's so much a part of how the early church grew in the Lord. So fellowship, what else? We also see the breaking of bread, which means the practice of communion right from that time. Because they were testifying to what Jesus has done. What is the breaking of bread? We know the broken body of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus, uh, and the power in it. So these are things that you know, they uh, they uh, put their faith in. So they practiced the Holy Communion. And another aspect there is prayer. Okay, so we'll just wrap up right now. There's so much to talk uh, from uh, you know each verse. It's really hard to go past. Uh, in uh, the book of Acts, but we will do our best to uh, catch up uh, speed to complete things on time. So let's just uh, pray for now and uh, we will wrap up. Uh, again, I want to request one of us to uh, pray, please, and then we will close this call. Uh, Rosalind, would you be able to pray? Let's pray. Wonderful Heavenly Jesus, Lord God, we thank you, Father God, for the wonderful session that we had, O oh Lord. Indeed, Father God, Lord, thank you for the gift of Holy Spirit that you have given to us, O oh Lord. Father God, we pray, Father God, even as we are uh, studying and meditating on the Acts of Apostles, Father God, that which you did in that time oh lord father we pray almighty god that you use us also father god for this generation oh lord father god let the works of the holy spirit be manifested through our lives oh lord and father god 
the words that the Holy Spirit will speak through us, Father God, may impact those that hear us, O oh Lord, in whatever uh, ministry that you have given us, O oh Lord, help us to be faithful in that, O oh Lord, and uh, use us for your glory. Lord, we thank you and we bless Pastor Nancy also, Father God. Anoint her mightily, Father God, and uh, use her mightily for your kingdom's expansion. Lord, we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rosalind. Thank, thank you, everyone. God bless you. We'll uh, continue uh, next week. Uh, till then, please take time to read uh, the Book of Acts. God bless. Bye for now. Thank you.